Um, because if you're trying to gauge, especially Jeff and Elon or, or people like myself on traditional business metrics, you're going to fail. They made their money so they could do space. They are not doing space to make their money. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required, hosted by LBW. This podcast is intended for free thinkers, entrepreneurs, and knowledge seekers. Join us as we discuss relevant financial topics, explore with guests their financial journeys, and engage with experts in industries such as space, media and entertainment, real estate, and many more. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required. You're with your hosts, myself, Tim Bickmore, and my two colleagues, Dan Weiss and Nathaniel Leach. And we have a guest today, and we're really excited about this guest. We have Rick Tumlinson with us. Uh, Rick is one of the co-founders of Space Fund, and we're going to talk about space and the business of space, which as people listen to my podcast um, about myself, I'm, I am definitely one of those nerds when it comes to space and physics. So I'm really excited to talk to Rick. But before we really get started, I want to make sure all our listeners are introduced to Rick. So I'm going to read a quick bio, and then we're going to get it kicked off and start asking Rick some questions. So, uh, new space revolution godfather, one of the world's top space visionaries, and listed in the top 100 most influential space people. Rick led the year-long commercial takeover of the Mir space station and signed the world's first commercial space traveler. Winning of the 2015 World Technology Award, co-founder of the Space Frontier Foundation and founding board member of the X Prize, he started the New Worlds Institute, Earth Light Foundation, and Space Fund, a venture capital company. One of the best speakers on space, Rick's writing and quotes show up worldwide, from the New York Times to the People's Daily. A six-time congressional witness, he helped start many sp space projects, including the first mission to discover water on the moon. Rick, wonderful bio. You have done a lot. I'm super excited to kind of get into some questions. Yeah, I only made up some of that. So Just uh, a few. Somebody we else. We don't do any fact checking. You're fine. Somebody else wrote that. <laughs> Hey, as an icebreaker, Rick, yes. can you tell our audience Star Wars, Star Trek, or Battlestar Galactica? I know that's kind of maybe not in the same realm, but top line, which one? Oh, man, you're asking for trouble. Um, number one, Star Wars is not science fiction. It's a fantasy. It just happens to be set in space, right? It's like an Arthurian legend uh, in space type thing. So I, it's off the list. Right, it's 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 with Lord of the Rings. It's it's that kind of thing, right? Um, the uh, uh, between the other two, Battlestar Galactica, love it. Dark, uh, the newer one, the old one was just hilarious. The the original one, um, but uh, set in a, uh, a universe, you know, that's kind of inverted and happened before humans and all of that. So, um, uh, but I love it. Uh, really good show. Um, um, so that leaves Star Trek. I love Star Trek. I've always loved Star Trek. I'm actually quasi binging the the new one, Discovery now. Um, and I've been very lucky to to meet different people in the Star Trek universe over the years. Um, in fact, when we if we talk at all about my history, it was Gene Roddenberry that. Um, inadvertently helped accelerate me on my path at one point when I was in college. Um, but, but I love discovery, um, the, the new one. And uh, even though the first season, eh, but then it picks up and the last episode of the uh, second season has one of the best in space battles I've ever seen. Right. The one you left off your list, which is the current best hardcore science fiction show is the expanse. And um, we gave them an award at our uh, Space Cowboy Ball a few years ago um, for really trying to get it right. You know, it's, it's a show that has real scientists, real engineers on staff. Could you tell us a little bit about really um, when and why space has become and it has for a long time been a passion for you? We imagine, which it'd be great if you could highlight some of this too, that a lot of that might have to do with a book that you have referred to us as the Bible, the high frontier. Um, it perhaps 
perhaps that provided some inspiration and perhaps that inspiration was before that book, but maybe you can tell us where all of this kind of sparks from. Yeah, um, it's funny because I'm actually writing a book right now. So I'm in thick in the middle of this and um, it's not gonna be a, an I was there biography, but I am um, touching on things in my life to launch into topics. And so, uh, see, I slipped the word launch in there, launch into topics. But anyway, the, um, yeah, look, I, you know, I was an asthmatic kid. Uh, my first camping trip was an oxygen tank, basically. Um, and um, my way of um, transcending the world around me, I wasn't, I had a quasi unhappy childhood, blah, blah, blah. But my way of transcending that was science fiction. And um, Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, the three gods of science fiction, uh, carried me to new places. So I could, I, it was almost like that scene in, uh, you know, uh, Peter Pan, where he's like hovering outside the window of the kids and like, come with me and I'll take you away. That's what science fiction did for me. They beamed me up, beamed me out into a future. And I could recreate myself as, as one of the heroes of science fiction in my mind. Um, um, and the beauty of that, um, and, and it's the same for this, this generation that I call Apollo's children or, or the orphans of Apollo, which is a documentary that was made about one of my projects, um, is that we had science fiction and we had real people doing stuff. And so if you take the eyes of a child uh, or look at this through the eyes of a child or a kid growing up, you know, you're reading about this amazing future in science fiction and it's on TV, you know, in its early form right now. And you're, that all ties together, right? And it was also an escape. Uh, you know, at, the, at that point in time, we were being faced with the Cold War. Um, nuclear Armageddon was, you know, hanging out there. Um, and it was a matter of, uh, of, of kind of rejecting that and, and wanting to create something great in the future. And this goes the same for myself or Elon, Jeff, an entire generation that grew up within that 10 or 15 year span. Um, so that is what kind of got me going. And then I led a terribly bad life as far as not, I, I, it wasn't like I knew this is what I was going to do. And I stayed in school and made straight A's and I was the valedictorian. No, I partied my ass off. I took every drug conceivable. I was a, uh, a metal rocker. I grew up um, off and on in the UK. Um, you know, I was terrible. I was terrible. I turned down all my scholarships because I was in love with a girl. I didn't go to the colleges that accepted me. Um, and I just veered off into Nanu land, man. And, um, but then it was always there and it was always pulling me back and always pulling me back. And I, I went through some personal, um, um, advancement kind of courses and stuff. It, I did this thing and, and I'm not trying to plug this. It was called EST. It's called Landmark now, uh, Landmark Forum. And, and I took it and it jarred me. A friend of mine paid for me to take it. She had taken it and said, this is awesome. And it jarred me so much. And I came out of it and it was really funny. I was like, oh, that didn't do anything to me. A year later, I'd gotten engaged to the woman I married, moved to New York City, and changed my career and dedicated my life to the cause, which I didn't know was the cause yet, uh, called Opening the Frontier. I started the L5 Society of New York. We were based on the Intrepid Aircraft Carrier. Uh, L5 was the activist organization uh, of the time uh, focused on human settlement of space. And uh, then I went from there, but what had inspired the L5 Society and all of these other space organizations that are out there now, directly or indirectly, was a book by a guy named Gerard K. O'Neill. Now, Dr. O'Neill um, wrote a book called The High Frontier. And uh, it's roughly, I think, over here, over my shoulder, up against the wall. Uh, hardback, that's an original. And um, in his book, Dr. O'Neill, in the mid-70s, I hadn't read it yet. I didn't read it till the 80s. I was a little late to this game. Um, basically, asked the question of his students, is the surface of a planet the best place for an expanding human civilization? Uh, he was trying to get the attention of his Princeton physics class. Then he started putting on a conference at Princeton. 
And we used to call it the um, Not Ready for Primetime Space Conference. And we would all show up there and you'd look around the room and there were other crazy people like yourself. And at the front of the room was a guy named Gordon Woodcock, who was the chief designer of the space station for Boeing at the time, a guy named Dr. Freeman Dyson and Gerard K. O'Neill. And you're sitting there and they're and giving out your crazy ideas and they're like, hmm, it's interesting. So for me, you know, again, I was not Ivy League, but like my buddy, Peter Diamandis, guy who created the XPRIZE and the uh, Singularity University and all this, he was in the room. Um, and then uh, a guy named Red Whitaker who founded the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Lab, uh, on and on. A guy named Eric Drexler who coined a little term called nano and nanotech, he was there. Um, so we're all sitting around, you know, and for me, it was great because somebody was listening. And Dr. O'Neill was a, a very gentle guy and he listened. Um, I used to tell the story about the, the three kinds of people in space. So you've got the, the Von Braunians, you know, which is, and we will build this rocket and we will use your tax dollars and you will be very, very proud of how we go into space. And I used to do that, but I got to be careful how you do that. Um, and then there was uh, Carl Sagan, which is like billions and billions of stars. Isn't the universe grand? Created by God, just for us. And you can go, well, look at it, but don't touch it, right? So he was like the king of astronomers. And Jerry O'Neill, he didn't have a funny accent, but he had like this weird beetle haircut his whole life. Um, but he was, he was very much about take your tools, democratic system, free enterprise and the resources of space and expand humanity. And so that's where everybody started coming off of that in the, in the late 80s, uh, early 80s. Um, I ended up volunteering and started working for Dr. O'Neill. Um, after a while, I got a bit impatient. I wanted, I believe that um, we needed to engage in the revolution. Dr. O'Neill was doing research and being a very kind man, but I felt we had to engage. And so I went after Washington um, and um, formed the Space Frontier Foundation. And we immediately went to war with the aerospace industrial complex. Um, and this is something that's important for your listeners to understand because it gets into what Jeff Bezos and Elon are doing and, and all of this. We can come back around to that later. But um, the aerospace industrial complex as it stood and still stands is vested in the idea of keeping prices as high as possible and keeping the contract pipeline going. And um, it's the idea that you get paid 10% of what it costs you to build something for the government, right? And it's called cost plus. And the funny thing about that is if you think about that, that's an incentive to make things expensive. Right? If you're the government and you need a beautiful red um, Rudy's barbecue plastic cup, uh, and I'm got to, and I'm Lockheed Martin, and I've got to go develop this beautiful red plastic cup for you, um, and you're going to give me, uh, you know, I, I, I get to make money off of how expensive it is if you're giving me that percentage. So that's where you get million dollar toilets. Because why would I build this for you for a dollar if I can build it for a million dollars and keep 10%? Right? That's, that's where it all comes back to. Um, and that was happening in space. So the incentive of space was to keep the price as high as possible, um, to fly the shuttles and, and feed as many contractors in as many political districts as possible. Our incentive to open the frontier to humanity is bring the cost down and get as many people as you can up there and make it as profitable as possible, which means reducing your infrastructure cost. Um, and so we've, uh, we've been fighting that fight all along. And eventually we started pushing ways to change the contracting to, to create pathways for the private sector to get more and more involved. And um, that led to us drawing up laws and policies that eventually enabled what you saw last summer, which was SpaceX to fly uh, people to the space station. In fact, in 1995, I testified in front of the House Space Subcommittee and, and demanded that all transportation to and from low Earth orbit be commercially provided. 
and that the United States never build human capable launch vehicles again. Um, and it only took us what, to, you know, 25 years. Hey, what is that in historical time, right? So it's, it's not fast enough, dude. I'll tell you right now. What uh, else is that? So Rick, I mean, uh, so coming from the standpoint of, you know, obviously that, that background story actually kind of leads into the next question, which I think is very pertinent. And it sounds like there's a lot of different ways you can get involved with space. And it seems like you've taken a route of activism as well as business, right? How can we generate and get involved from a business perspective? So obviously, you know, Space Fund is something that you've co-founded, which is, is a venture capital company. Um, so from a business lens, you know, with the fund and looking at a bunch of different companies, I know you have different tiers of sections that you're getting invested into or looking at. Could you just give us a rundown of like the space industry? What does it look like from an investable standpoint? Um, and is it difficult, I guess, from a regulation standpoint, because you have a lot of hands in that honeypot in a sense? The, um, the industry right now is reaching, a, it, it's in an interesting phase. And I can't say what it's, you know, 2.0, 3.0, whatever it is. Um, but where we are right now is that there's a level of sophistication starting to kick in. Um, in the in the startup realm, we're, we're coming across better and better business plans, and um, we are also at a moment where, uh, and and I, it makes me crazy that we have to bet essentially on one or two people. But if Elon, for example, um, is successful and is able to pull it off uh, with Starship, um, the entire I was going to say universe, uh, in a sense, yes, but um, the entire industry completely changes. Um, we move from horses to cars, you know. Can you, uh, can you, can you elaborate on that further, Rick? Like, what is uh, it? What exactly is, uh, does that? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, just so what does that exactly mean from horses? Just for our listeners, is that because of the funding? Is that the way that he's raising capital? You know, like where where is the transition? And, and by the way, it's it's not buying my voice because he gave me this hat. Um, gotcha. Yeah, anybody who knows me knows that. Uh, I'll take your hat and then I'll give you a hard time. Anyway, the uh, the thing about what's happening, and and we started pushing for this again many many years ago, is the creation of reusable transportation. Or let me back up a second here. There, there are three things. These are going to be in my book, by the way. Three things, three uh, keys to open space. One is reusable, low cost, dependable transportation to and from the frontier. Number two is the ability to utilize the resources of the frontier. And number three, is governments that either support you or stay the hell out of the way. We are finally reaching the point of being able to have number one and number three. And that is, if Elon is successful with Starship, his goal in that vehicle is to create a 100% totally reusable spaceship. It will no longer be a launch vehicle it will no longer be just a rocket. It will be a ship because, you know, in a ship, you don't throw anything away, right? That, that's the, 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 you know, subtle distinction there. He's going to fly to space and be able to do it repeatedly um, using very, you know, I, I like to point out to people um, that Elon is not doing anything magical, all right? And, and forgive me for diverging here. It's, it's just going to happen while we're talking, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, but Elon's not doing anything magical. There's nothing like he wasn't like, you know, God didn't reach down and go, Elon, boom. He's using the same nuts and bolts that they build traditional aerospace rockets out of. He's using the same steel. He's using the same chemicals in his propellant. All he's doing is starting from a different premise and with a different goal. And then bringing his, he does have genius and bringing that genius in and bringing a bunch of engineers in to develop it. But there's no magic here. In fact, if somebody else like an Elon had existed in a culture that would allow that to happen 15 or 20 or 30 years ago, 
we'd be doing this on Mars right now, the three of us or four of us. You know, it's really just a matter of him at the right moment in time with the right constraints removed and, and coming in and saying, I am going to create a railroad to space because he has a belief set that says, I want human beings to live out there. How do I do that with my money that I made on PayPal? Right, that's it, mm -hmm. that's it. And same thing, with Elon, same thing with Jeff, who by the way, read The High Frontier and used to sell it in his early book club days. He gave his valedictorian speech and basically said, in essence, I'm gonna make money and then I'm gonna go open the frontier. Right now, as you guys are business guys, and this is critical also for your people to understand who are listening. Um, because if you're trying to gauge, especially Jeff and Elon or, or people like myself on traditional business metrics, you're going to fail. They made their money so they could do space. They are not doing space to make their money. Understand that and you will understand them. This is not rich boys in their toys either. They have a center of the soul belief as to why they are doing this. And hell, on, hell or high water, they're going to make it happen. Now, that creates an industrial ecosystem around them. And when they succeed, not if, when they succeed, that ecosystem will expand. And we will see two kinds of businesses. Well, we have two kinds of businesses that are springing up right now. Those that will participate in and enable this breakout to occur. And then those kind of businesses that will benefit from it occurring. In other words, the suppliers of the technologies that are necessary to make it happen. Then the second wave hits, which is those kinds of companies that are enabled by those facilities. So that could range from your um, hospitality companies that are carrying people up there to people working in the labs, working on IP development, product development, microgravity related uh, research. And then that whole industry springs out. So those are the two types of space companies that we see out there. So Rick, I know um, I'd listened to a couple different podcasts and, and writings and different things that you've done um, over the years. And I know one of the things that you mentioned that really kind of piqued my interest and it kind of goes off of what you were just talking about is the return on investment within these companies. And you had mentioned that the return on investment is a long time frame to really develop. Um, do you feel like that's a hindrance when it comes to some of these companies, just with people not willing to invest their money for long periods of time? Or do you really need billionaires to have that type of wealth to really start the funding because they can kind of just do it on their own without having to go and lock up other people's capital? Yeah, it, it is a it's, a, it's a blend of both, actually. I, I think that right now in, in time, um, it is what I call, you know, passion investors, visionary investors. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's interesting. That's why we get a lot of investors from the blockchain world. Um, they are, um, blockchain people are already um, future thinkers. They're already geeks. You know, I can make a Star Trek joke and they get it, you know, um, the red shirt, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but, uh, um, but they're in it they're in it for cultural change in the long term. Um, and it is that kind of thinking that you have to have. Um, the shorter term stuff, I, I, get, I think once we get through the infrastructure transportation development phase, then we will start seeing shorter term uh, returns. Um, what's interesting is the, short, the small companies that I mentioned earlier, the startup companies, are starving to some degree for, for cash. And if you ask me about launch vehicles, I will give you the reason why. He said leading. <laughs> tell us why. There we go. Well, let me tell you why. Now, there are two, what time is it? 
Uh, yeah, okay. So there are too many launch vehicles out there. I'm checking the time because we seem to get a new one every 15 minutes. Um, I actually wrote an article called um, Boys Like Rockets, and there are too many of them. And I mean both. There are too many of us, and we need to talk about that cultural thing, perhaps. But there are also too many rocket companies. We have over 100 and I don't know what it is. I, I checked the time, you know, 125. Uh, something like that, 120. Um, there's probably only room for 10. Um, and, and those will break down by the way, by, excuse me, they'll break down in a, in a few different ways. Um, and it's going to be bloody, of course, financially bloody when that happens, when that shakedown starts to happen. Well, and Rick, what's, what's interesting about this is it, it makes, it drives my mind towards, okay, if there really becomes enough viability within the space industry, we're really creating a brand new industry, which is going to create a lot more potential jobs, which if you're looking at the United States, there's been a lot of struggle to continue to grow GDP, gross domestic product, right? Yeah. Where you could create new jobs, new technology, new money. Yeah. And so overall, you know, you're looking at it from the standpoint of private versus public. You also have the argument with China versus the United States. I know China has been pushing pretty hard to get into space. So it's the space race, I guess, similar to, to what we saw when we were trying to get to the moon. But it seems like there's a lot of bifurcation when it comes to the industry, which can either slow it down, can crush it, can create a lot of issues, potentially. So if this lack of unification, does that also then impact, impact the business prospects, aka increase that return of investment because we can't get on the same page to be able to get this unified, to be able to start the industry? Or do we really think that Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and these other gentlemen will really get us to the point where we can get there. And it sounds like it's serious enough that governments are becoming very much more attuned to it, more so than in the past. Um, from a, from a money-making standpoint, it seems like it's becoming more and more uh, real. So how do you function when it comes to the bifurcation on a lot of different levels, both the governmental, and then I know inside the industry, you've mentioned in a few different writings that there's some bifurcation. Is that in a, a really a large issue to the overall industry? Man, I could fill up the rest of your show with an answer to just that question. Yeah. You know, the government has done a great job getting us to this point and now needs to get out of the way. And what is happening, unfortunately, is that these companies, and this is my beef with, with Elon and, uh, and Jeff, frankly, is they've gotten themselves trapped in a sense by trying to be contractors uh, with the government. Um, I have no pr problem with them doing commercial satellite fly, uh, launches, things like that. But the moment they get themselves in bed too much with the flagship programs of NASA and the government, they become trapped in a sense. They run the risk of being trapped by the pace of the government's program. It is great to get, shoot, you know, take that extra money. They, these guys didn't become billionaires by not taking money from wherever it could come from, right? So they'll take the government money. But I, I think you can, you can uh, with that comes a price, you know, come on over here. You know, I've got a couple of bucks, come here. Uh, so I'm worried about that. Um, as far as the uh, the bifurcation, the it's not bifurcation. It's, it's it's a lot of stuff going on. Now let's talk about China for a second. Um, unless you want to talk about that later, but we. The China's great. If you want to hit on China, that'd be great. China. Yeah, let's give China some hard time. Um, so look, China. There's a whole history there. I urge your listeners to go look up uh, Xing He, um, who was the admiral um, that took a fleet out um, in the 1400s before Columbus of ships that were so big, you could put the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria on the deck of one of these ships, right? And they went around the world, and he was a eunuch, uh, uh, or as a friend of mine says, a eunuch kind of guy. I'm kidding. Uh, but he was a eunuch, and eunuchs held an important place in, in, the, uh, in the court of China at the time. Um, if you think about it, it made a lot of sense because they couldn't have heirs, and therefore they weren't a threat to the dynasty. 
Um, and he was an admiral who took these fleets out and they were sailing down the coasts of Africa. There is an argument that was put out that they actually went all the way around the world. Um, it's very intriguing. There's a whole show you can do on that. Uh, some very interesting maps and genetic things that show up in different places around the world. Um, but it was really interesting because he, having done that, basically what they were doing is they weren't trying to conquer at the time. They were just trying to proclaim the glory of the emperor, right? So they would show up with all of this knowledge and all this great stuff. And, you know, yeah, we'll take a couple of giraffes and elephants back and, and things like that. But overall, they were just hanging out, showing people how great they were. And you can imagine being on the coast of Africa or somewhere else when this gigantic fleet comes over the horizon. It was awe-inspiring. Well, the regime changed. And the, um, the eunuchs lost. And they were out of favor. And banned all exploration. And China went basically, essentially, behind the wall. And they didn't come out until Mao's revolution. And then they kind of came out and they were still internal oriented. Well, it's no accident if you look at the number of names and such in the new Chinese space program that reflect back to Shanghai, right? It, it is them coming out and reclaiming what they believe to their, is their heritage. Um, Quick side note, apparently some of this started right after some lectures by this guy named Gavin, um, I can't think of a Gavin's name, but he, uh, he gave lectures in Beijing about that heritage where he claimed that they had gotten around the world before uh, Columbus and, uh, and the others. And it was a couple of years later that their program kicks into high gear. It also happened that we kicked out a major scientist from the United States, an engineer who is the father of the Chinese space program which is a point I'll make about why we should work with them rather than, you know. Um, in Texas, we have a saying, you know, are they on the outside of the tent pissing in or the inside pissing out? I'd, I'd rather have them on the inside. Um, now, trust but verify, be careful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the kind of things we've done, for example, working with the Russians is huge. It's, it's huge. Even, even as we've gone through the Cold War, uh, the troubles we're having now, there's one place in the universe where Russians and Americans get along and don't just get along, but they actually care about each other. And that's 150 miles up. And that's a model that we need. Even, as, even understanding, paying honor to, and making sure that you manage the strategic relationship so that we maintain leadership. But there's no reason not to work with the Chinese in space. Otherwise, we're creating our competitors. You know, I would rather have them participating with us making incremental change on the way we're developing space stations than force them to create their own and then come after us and come after our markets. And how do we do that? Enable the private sector to go. What do you think and I'll change the word from what I was originally thinking because I've now learned it's not PC. What do you think settlement in space looks like? Yeah. Eventually the goal is that the settlement, uh, human settlements in space are as independent as possible from, from material, physical dependence on earth and control of earth. One thing we do know, by the way, is wherever you send people and no matter where they come from, after a generation or two, they basically say, screw you. You don't understand us. We are independent. By the way, that's one reason I'm not too worried about who sends people out there. Because <laughs> they could be Chinese. And after a while, they're going to be like, you know what? Sorry, Beijing. You don't get us. We are independent, right? Um, but it always happens that way. You're right. Yeah. Moon, read The Moon is a Harsh Mistress and by Robert Heinlein. Lays it all out for you. I hear there's a movie coming, by the way. So anyway, what do the settlements look like? They, they're going to look. They're going to be different no matter where where they are and who founds them, right? They're going to be groups of people who come together when there is capability, and they go buy or rent a starship. Starships, by the way, carry about 100 people. So I call them Mayflower class spaceships because there were about 100 people, 115. A couple of people got 
one guy went overboard, whatever, but you know, uh, with the original uh, pilgrims. So people could show up and, and buy one or two of these and some supply missions and go establish a settlement. Would you expect then to see the first settlement be on Mars? Ooh. Depends on the starship thing, right? Um, if possible, I know that Elon's going to do that. That's his. That's his Jones, man. That's where he's going, Mars. But somebody could declare something in free space. By the way, free space is what I call. I've called for years the places between worlds. Excuse me. Which I think in the long run may be where the action is. The first settlement on Mars will probably be Elon and SpaceX. They're going to have their own rules. They may be corporate. Not sure how that's going to play out. Um, on the moon, it's a toss up, probably more uh, of a colony in terms of the strict sense of being a government controlled uh, entity. It'll be an outpost, a um, uh, that kind of thing. Although I love the European term moon village. I like that. It's it's nice and neutral, nice, very European, soft way of dealing with it. Uh, it's very cool. I'm curious then, if getting to Mars mm -hmm. to create a settlement, is that, I'm sure it's about both, but is it more you think about obtaining resources or is it more about creating a settlement for human existence? Because when you bring free space into this, it sounds like you maybe don't need so much to get to Mars to at least create the second one, but you still might for the first. Right. If you're going to Mars, you're going because of a belief set, not a profit motive. There is no real export from Mars to the earth that can't be had closer and at less cost, be that from the lunar surface or even more cheaply from the asteroids and comets in the solar system. You're not going there for a profit. It's, you gotta go down into, so planets have gravity. We call that the gravity well. And we call it that because it's a pain in the ass to go down the gravity well and get back out and climb out of it, right? So we have a 1G gravity well. Then you have the moon, which has had one sixth G gravity well, one sixth the gravity of the earth. Mars has one third, it's really easy to remember, one sixth, one third, one, right? No matter which one you go to, you gotta climb down the damn gravity well and climb out the damn thing before you can do anything. And that costs you, that costs you propellant. It costs you technology systems and things like that. However, once you're up in free space, Robert Heinlein, I'm, para I'm gonna paraphrase it, I'm sorry, Mr. Heinlein, paraphrase it real badly. He said a hundred miles up and you're halfway to anywhere. Basically, and I'm, this is way simplifying it, um, but if you were up out of the Earth's gravity field high enough and you're, you can escape and you can push something towards Mars and your orbital mechanics is good enough, it'll eventually just get there with one push. So you don't have to burn all this propellant and fuel and do all of this stuff to get there. So if you've got the time and you're in space, you could set up a supply chain it's just one tank, you know, one box car after another, one after another, one after another, and get all you want to wherever you want it in space. But going back to your, your original question, the thing that may make money on Mars is IP, intellectual property, right? Things like closed life support system. How do you survive in a closed system, et cetera, et cetera. But again, there's a problem with that because the people on the moon are going to be doing the same damn thing, right? And they're right there. They're three days away. They're in the backyard. You know, it's, it's like camping in the backyard before you go out into the wilderness, right? Um, it's about three days away to and from the moon. 
It's months away to go to Mars. And they're going to be right there. They have to face the same challenges. So all of this life support, thermal um, management, uh, recycling, all of this stuff, they're going to be handling it right there. So it kind of shoots away. You're going to Mars because you believe in Mars. Now, since you guys are business guys, the important part of that is all of those people going to Mars, they, they want clothes, entertainment, places to live, products. And now you've got an industrial ecosystem that can build around that. You know, as they used to say, it wasn't the gold miners that made all the money, it was Levi's. <laughs> we, we got one last question for you, Rick. So you, you already touched on this uh, a little bit when you mentioned that both uh, Mr. Musk and Mr. Be Mr. Bezos, they don't care about making money in space. They, they chose to make money first to then take that money and then use it to go into space. So my question to you then is, as they continue to find success in their respective space or, uh, companies, SpaceX and Blue Origins, what do you think that that could mean for their focus on their respective companies, Tesla and Amazon? Hmm. Interesting question. I fully expect that at some point, Jeff will hand off Amazon. Again, it's the means to an end for him. Um, and he's going to give more and more and more of his time to Blue Origin. And I, I will certainly be nudging that way. They don't listen to me, but I'll try, you know. Um, I think that's where they should go. So Amazon will become a thing, you know, on its own. And there'll be the Amazon services stuff that'll involve some space activities. It'll be a straight up commercial company, um, Silicon Valley model, destroy everybody else, own everything, right? Um, so they'll do that. Um, Elon with SpaceX is very interesting in Tesla. If you think about it, um, and it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but everything Elon's doing ties into living on Mars. Electric cars, solar, power, even the boring company. You know why? Because you won't be living on the surface of Mars. You'll be living under it because of radiation. So everything he's doing ties in AI, all of the enhanced stuff, all of this. He is going out there to create a new branch of civilization. Um, and I think that uh, as it becomes more and more, um, I got to tell you, I think he is probably having finally the time of his life with Starship. It is the, it is, it is the penultimate closest um, approximation of his childhood dream, of all the things he's done getting to that Starship, you know, and then they're going to fly Starship to launch satellites until they test, you know, until they've proven it. And then after that, human beings. I think that's where he's going. Um, I think it's part of the reason, by the way, he moved, you know, here. Um, although capital gains and personal taxes probably has a little bit to do with it. Um, but um, yeah, so look, the, the thing is, in the long run, we, we barely touched on investing and stuff like that. Um, we're on the edge of not just a new world, but an infinite set of new worlds. And from your business perspective, every one of those and all of it is a new market and a new industrial laboratory it's new customers, it's new consumers, it's new products, it's all of the elements that go into a free enterprise system are all going to be playing there. And they're all going to be a part of this new economy. And this one, this is what excites me about it. It's endless. Everybody gets to play. We're not taking it from anybody. And rather than the ongoing attack on the biological ecosystem that we have engaged in in this planet since we started burning things, 
in caves, we are going to be expanding the domain of life rather than shrinking it. It's a complete reversal of all the paradigms of what it has meant to be a human being up until now. Because see, space is dead. It's not just dead, it's deadly. And as we go out into it, whatever the motivation, you're expanding the domain of living things into a place that is dead. Now, my big thing outside of, you know, I, you know, I have to pay my bills and do that kind of stuff and make, you know, make money in business. When people look back in a thousand years, from a thousand year view back to this period of time, which I believe we are at the end of the most important hundred years in the history of humanity and beyond humanity, uh, life itself, maybe even the consciousness of the universe. If you believe that this is the only world where there are sentient beings, which it may be, and even if it isn't, I can only bet on the cards I can see, and I can see the cards on this planet, so I can't bet they're out there. And if sentient beings are the elements of the universe that allow the universe to know that it exists, in other words, they are the only carriers of an opinion or a viewpoint or an understanding, okay? And we're in the middle of this 100-year period. In fact, we're at the last 10 years of it. And I'm going to start that 100-year period around World War II. So let's say 1940 or so. The world's industries had all come together into a big network. We were getting on the edges of technology within that first five or 10 years that could destroy the planet. All of these things started happening about 100 years ago. And now we're at the peak of that. We have the technology to totally destroy the planet at the push of a button and through the push of our industry into that world. All of these things are happening. We have the knowledge to look back into history for the first time and really understand it. We have the knowledge to project forward as to where we're going. We're literally on the cusp of destroying the planet through our industrialization. And yet the same minds, the same innovation, the same technology, the same framework that allows us to, to kill ourselves will allow us to break out of the cradle and using the tools of, of democracy, free enterprise, our ability to cooperate globally with this global mind that we finally created right in the last 10 or 15 years called the interweb, called the Google, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. We can all work together now and step out of this planet and begin to make ourselves unkillable because if you're a species that wants to live and have children and have those children's children and children and children and move on and protect the civilization and expand life, you have to leave where you are and expand. And every time we move out of the bubble and expand that bubble, we're helping to assure the sustenance and the expansion of life. And every next step we take assures it a little further. And every new planet we live on expands it further. And as we move out of the solar system, we're expanding it further. To me, that's our job. In closing, I, I, I had intended to maybe quote, you know, like uh, something that, that Spock would say or something, but, but I'm not going to. I, I, think, um, I think what really got me was 100 miles up and you're halfway to anywhere. Boy, is that a pivotal statement. So I, before I pass it off to one of my partners, I'm, I'm gonna leave it right there. Just that's phenomenal. And your insight was phenomenal, Rick. Tim, what are your thoughts? You know, I, Rick, I know you mentioned a few times that we didn't hit on business, but in my opinion, I think we hit on a lot of business aspects actually of space. Um, and, you know, our podcast is called Critical Thinking Required for a Reason, and I think you brought the essence of that today. Um, to think differently, you talked a lot about paradigm shifts, your intentions, you know, just because you're a capitalist doesn't mean you can't have an intention to better the earth, better, better civilization, but you have to have money to drive you there. You have, you know, money is a tool, and that tool is used um, for good or for bad, depending on who's using it. And uh, the, your insights just to, you know, free space and Mars and the moon uh, was fantastic. And, and I really appreciate it. And it puts a lot of perspective on the potential industry of space. 
Um, and I'm excited to see where it goes. I mean, like, I, like you, I'm, I'm a space nerd myself, a hobbyist. I would call myself a hobbyist at best. But um, it, it is very exciting and it's interesting. And, and your last statement there uh, was very well said. It was very well said. So thank you, Rick. Rick, I, I really don't have much. I, I think that uh, what you just ended with about the hope that we learn from our past mistakes, I really hope that to be the case. But uh, as I always like to say, uh, humans are irrational by nature. Yeah. So I, I hope that we can, we can counter that with rationality, but. Well, one of the interesting elements, um, and it's because I'm writing about this right now, is something that is about to happen when we, when we do get people out there living in space and, and that they're um, able to take the technologies we've developed and utilize them to transform the resources and the energy that's out there and transform the resources into whatever they want. Um, I mean, the simplified version is Star Trek, you know, you order a cheeseburger and boom, there it is. That day will come, right? It, it's just reassembling molecules and, and stuff like that. Um, but if you take like additive manufacturing, solar power, AI, and the ability to, to harvest resources from let's say asteroids, we will have gone full circle. It will be probably post-capitalist. It'll be post everything that we talk about down here. The last time that a small group of people, let's say a family or a small tribe, were able to live completely independently of anybody else was before civilization. They lived in the woods, they picked the berries, you know, had the squirrel, whatever, but they were completely ind independent. Trade was voluntary. It was, oh, you've got that, I've got this, fine, let's just do that, you know, but I don't need you. I am completely 100% independent from you in my little tribe. All right. We then went into this industrial civilization and dependency became the name of the game and trade and interaction and civilization. There is going to be a time probably within the next hundred years where groups of human beings will be completely independent of the earth with their AI, their additive manufacturing, all the space resources they need, all the energy they need. They'll be little pods of human beings that don't have to interact with anybody, which by the way, makes them politically independent completely. It's an interesting thought. We will have gone full circle through this whole industrial thing back to complete control of all of the links of the chain of industrial processes and complete ownership of our own destiny in our families or our little units. That's mind blowing. And what I'm, why I'm saying that is so that you understand that as we cross this threshold into the universe, the conversations that we've had as apes with guns, because that's all we are, we're just, we're just apes running around. We don't know what the hell happened. Someday, some point in the past, we got consciousness, but we're still freaking animals, right? We're not, we're literally going into a higher plane at this point and we will be able to redesign who we are, as I talked about all those different types of designs, but the culture itself will start to spread out in a diaspora like nothing we've ever seen if we make it through the next 10 years. You know, we appreciate you spending time and, and speaking to our audience and we haven't seen you since pre-pandemic ourselves. So it's great to be able to interact and, and say hi and catch up a little before this podcast. And then of course, uh, having all your insight during it, it just, uh, we just really very much thank you for doing so. And also want to just thank, as always, our audience for uh, thinking critically with uh, the whole bunch of us. And we wish you a, a great night. Right. And make sure you hit the Earthlight Foundation website and make a donation. We take Bitcoin and you Bitcoin people are doing pretty darn good right now. So <laughs> Help somebody out. The, um, and the Earthlight Endowment is going to be giving out grants and prizes to groups of people that are underrepresented in space. 
women, um, LGBTQ, indigenous um, people, uh, starting with children, giving prizes for design contests, things like that. We have a formula for our giving that will allow us to start giving one year after we hit our first 100K in the endowment. And it doesn't sound like you can give much off of that. Let's say you have a 10% rate of return, which is optimistic, but eh. Um, so you have $5,000. That doesn't sound like a lot until you're giving away 10 $500 scholarship prizes to a sixth grader for designing a space habitat, right? And then we're gonna grow it and grow it and grow it over time. So anybody out there who's making a lot of coin, we could use your help. Let's change the world. Thank you for taking the time to start your journey of thinking differently and listening to LBW talk about stuff they love. Until next time.